Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Collinsworth. I'm the general manager of the Brazos River Authority. We really appreciate you taking time today to join us uh, for our brown bag on the Brazos. This is something that we've been doing now for over a year, uh, following our recently following our board meetings uh, to try to give updates on uh, some of the things that our board is is considering and taking action on. Uh, but also using this time to, to update uh, folks on what's hot and heavy in the water business, what's going on at the Brazos River Authority. Uh, it allows us to talk about drought. It allows us to talk about our projects. So I think we have a good agenda for you today. Uh, we promise to keep it to one hour so you can get back to uh, uh, you can get back to your uh, routine and your jobs and your day. Judy, we've got something on the screen there. There you go. Thank you. <clears throat> so. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, next slide, please. This is what our agenda looks like today. I'll give you a brief overview of our board meeting uh, that we had a couple of weeks ago. Our water services manager, Aaron Abel, will talk a little bit about uh, downstream releases uh, that we have planned as it relates to uh, managing our reservoirs through this drought period that we're in. He'll talk a little bit about rain too. Uh, we've got some in the forecast. Uh, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, turn it over to our technical services manager. Our technical services department uh, includes our engineering and project management folks, and, and he'll give you some updates on uh, some projects that are going on. Uh, and then we'll get into questions and, and take as many questions and give as many answers as we can. Next, Judy. So the way the way that we do these uh, so that we can be efficient with our time is, is ask that folks ask questions online and here's how to do that. Uh, you can ask a question. You can click on the question bubble in the upper right hand corner of your screen uh, and then type in your answer. Uh, I mean, type in your question and we'll get to many as many of them as we can. The ones that we don't will answer online. Uh, if you'd rather use another uh, avenue of asking us questions, you can always go to information at Brazos.org uh, and ask questions, and that's where we'll also post uh, some of our answers. Next, next, Judy. So let's talk a little bit about our, our, our board meetings. Uh, our board meets uh, every other month. They meet six times a year. Uh, you can actually go to Brazos.org and view our board meetings. Uh, they're also uh, streamed live via YouTube. Uh, so you can watch them live as they're happening or uh, as I'm showing here on the screen, you can go to uh, Brazos.org, uh, go to a specific agenda item and listen and watch uh, what our board considered and, and the actions that they took. Uh, so our next board meeting will be November the 14th. Uh, our last board meeting was in September. Uh, we had a, a pretty full agenda uh, and they took action on a, a couple of items that I'd like to just uh, briefly talk about uh, because they're uh, pretty significant. Uh, one of the items that they considered uh, was uh, approving some funding, allowing our staff to go out and, and study a water snake. And you might think, well, you know, what are what are we doing studying water snakes? Uh, well, the, this particular snake, the Brazos water snake, uh, is on a list uh, being reviewed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, and may one day either be listed as a threatened species or an endangered species. Uh, so. Uh, the Brazos River Authority, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and uh, the State Comptroller's Office have teamed up and we are all looking at different aspects of the water snake and trying to collect science uh, so that we can better understand if that snake is threatened or if that snake is endangered or just understand uh, the population of the snake and the uh, the habitat where that snake may uh, may roam. So this this data will help both the state of Texas uh, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife better understand this uh, this snake, and if if there are any special activities that need to happen to protect this snake, or uh, if there's nothing that needs to happen because the snake's population is thriving. So those are all the questions that need to be answered. Uh, we're excited to spend some money and get out in the field and, and better understand the habitat of the snake and and uh, what's going on uh, with the Brazos water snake. Uh, also, we've got a, a construction project that we got approval to begin down at Lake Granger uh, in Williamson County at uh, one of our uh, water pump station intake sites. Uh, over the years, we've had a little bit of erosion uh, because of excessive rains and, and high winds and, 
and things like that. So uh, we're doing a stabilization project uh, and our board approved some money for us to begin that uh, that construction. So we're real excited to move that forward to protect our assets. Uh, that's uh, that was pretty much uh, kind of the meat of the sandwich, if you will. Again, you can go online and see the other agenda items uh, that were uh, uh, kind of uh, program updates and and stuff like that. So uh, feel free to do that. And uh, uh, another thing that I want to talk about just very briefly is uh, last month we also had a uh, a public meeting on a project that that uh, that's underway. It's in the uh, uh, design and engineering phase, uh, and we're starting the permitting phase of that project. And it is a, a pipeline project that will connect Bell uh, Lake Belton to Lake Steelhouse. Uh, so you can go online and uh, www.brazos.org and we have uh, a location. We have some information about this project online and you can go uh, see the presentation and make comments on this project if you want uh, and learn more about it. So I, I, I uh, invite you to do that and learn more about that project and there'll be uh, more discussions on that project as we move it forward. Uh, in this multi-year process of, of getting both a permit and finalizing the engineering and design and finalizing the routes and, and stuff like that that goes along with such a, a very large project. Uh, so with that, uh, that project is, is uh, to be put in place to help us manage through droughts. So Aaron, why don't you uh, take it away and talk a little bit about uh, our drought situation and, and uh, future of water releases and, and kind of the status of our reservoirs. Yeah, thank y'all. Uh, you should be able to see the, the presentation now, but you know, as David mentioned, we're, we're going to walk walk you through several items today. Um, we'll talk about the the current status of the BRA water supply system, uh, provide some updates on the impact of the ongoing drought conditions in the Brazos. We'll talk, as mentioned, you know, our downstream water supply releases and and what has happened and what we're seeing, um, you know, moving forward. We'll, we'll also provide some information as we did last time of how the BRA water supply system compares now in this drought in 2022 compared to you know 11 years ago when we experienced the significant drought of 2011 that extended into you know through 2015 for the most part we'll talk a little more about um, how the system is functioning, uh, some of the decisions that that we have to make uh, to ensure that water is provided throughout our system. And, and finally, we'll round out um, the segment talking about what to expect in the shorter term and, and over the next several months and, and maybe what to expect, um, you know, into early next year. So um, we'll first talk about, you know, what we've seen as far as the departure from normal precipitation. So this is a, a graphic that shows the Brazos River Basin outline as, as well as our um, system of reservoirs, the 11 reservoirs um, that are in our system, uh, three that we own and operate, Possum Kingdom, Lake Granbury and Lake Limestone, and then eight other core reservoirs that we have storage contracts and water rights in. Um, so you know, th this, this compares the departure from normal rainfall that occurred from January through October 10th of, of this year. And you'll see a lot of these um, yellows and, and reds and oranges. And so you know, so far th this year, the the lower portion of the basin, and when I say lower portion, I'm talking about, you know, around the Lake Somerville area downstream, has been short about eight to 20 inches of rain that than what normally occurs over the first nine months of the year. So, um, you know, we've seen rainfall deficits uh, of 20 inches or more uh, since January in, in the lower portion of, uh, you know, Brazoria County. Um, yeah, especially and, and for comparison, this is typically, you know, the wettest part of the Brazos River Basin and lower portion of the basin. They they usually, you know, through the first nine months of the year, they used usually receive 40 to 50 inches of rain on average. So they're essentially seeing um, only 40 to 50 percent of the rainfall that, that typically falls in that in that first nine months of the year. And then you, the other area that you'll see that, um, you know, has the the darker reds and oranges is is the central portion of our basin and you know in the Bell, Coriel, McLennan, Hamilton Hill, Comanche and Erath County. So around you know Lake Proctor area downstream to Belton uh, over to Lake Whitney uh, and Aquila 
you know, those are, and then also in, into Williamson County, those, those are some counties that have also seen below normal, significant below normal precipitation. Um, you know, really they just re have received 12 to 16 inches of less rain than, than what's normal. And in, in other words, you know, these areas have received only 40 to 50 percent of the rain that, that typically falls in, in that first nine months of the year. Um, you know, other areas uh, have seen a little bit more rain, but, you know, we're still below normal. Um, and generally the basin and um, in, in other areas have seen four to 12 inches below normal rainfall uh, since January. And we'll talk a little bit later about how this has impacted uh, the amount of water that flows into the reservoirs in the system and, and also uh, in the river downstream. So this is, I know a lot of folks had, you know, we did receive some above normal rainfall in the latter part of August and early September. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of folks thought, well, wow, there's, we, we've received a lot of rain or more, more rain than normal and, you know, the drought is over. Um, but, you know, that that's that's really not the case. But I, I did want to point out where we did receive the this above, above normal rainfall in, in August. And you'll see that, um, you know, in the par portions of the lower basin, primarily and, you know, from Austin County down through Fort Bend and, and Brazoria counties, we, we did see you know, four to five inches of rain above normal in, in that part of the area. You know, August, we typically don't receive much rain, but, you know, we, we did benefit from, you know, an unusual, um, you know, late late August uh, rainfall event. And also, we, we did see some above normal um, rain in August, in the latter part of August, in, in the upper portions of the basin uh, as well. Uh, Far, far upstream of Possum Kingdom. Elsewhere, we saw, you know, not much rain, um, and and we'll talk a little bit about what, you know, what what that did to the system. Um, you know, one of the things that with the rain in the lower portions of the basin that did generate enough runoff um, to to increase the stream flows um, along the main stem um, in, in that part of the basin that satisfied our, our customers. So we have some customers. That have water rights and they're, they're able to divert water um, during most times without the need of of stored reservoir releases and um, in times when the stream flows decline and they get to a point where they can't divert enough water to meet their needs so we have to release water from the reservoirs to to increase the availability in this in the river and allow them to to use the, the water that's needed to continue operations so we were able to discontinue some of those water supply releases, downstream water supply releases that, that were coming out of um, Lake Somerville, um, you know, at the latter part of August. And we, we were able to, to the, uh, discontinue those releases for about, about three weeks. So, you know, from a total system storage standpoint, how, how does this, um, you know, year compare to, to 2011? And, you know, I think we showed this this graphic uh, last time in the last brown bag, but you know one of the things that is different about 2022 versus 2011 as far as it is a significant drought, but we did receive some rainfall in um, obviously in, in the la last summer uh, from May through really through August that that really increased reservoir storage heading into this drought, and and that was really you know a, a big um, you know, difference in, in this drought versus 2011, we had it into this drought uh, a little bit better off. And um, so with the wet spring and summer of, of last year, uh, the other thing I mentioned about the downstream water supply releases in 2022, yeah, we, we have pointed out in, in these two lines. So th this is basically the storage trace of, of all 11 reservoirs within the system. So at, at combined, so when we say, you know, 95% full, that's that's 95% of the storage that, that we could hold in all 11 reservoirs combined. And as we move forward, the, the blue is the 2021 through 2022 trace. And you can see that we didn't initiate downstream water supply releases until uh, the first week in June of this year. And that's about two months uh, later than what, what we had to do in 2011. 2011, uh, we had um, a, a lot of, we had less rainfall below the reservoirs in, in, in that year 
and we had to initiate downstream water supply releases to augment the river levels uh, in the in the lower basin um, you know as early as, as April of 2011. Um, we did um, you know with the rain that we received in late August we you know like like I mentioned we did uh, were able to stop those releases the downstream releases in 2022 for about two and a half to, to three weeks and, and we had but we did have to resume those releases on, on uh, September 10th um, with the onset of, of um, you know the increased uh, temperatures and, and and below normal rainfalls that, that we've had in, in September you know currently we're at 72.8 percent as, as of October 12th and, and you'll see that you know we have been on average um, declining about one percent um, in, in a total system storage per week. That's about 14 to 15,000 acre feet of water that's either being released from the reservoirs, used directly from the reservoirs, or through evaporation losses. losses. So um, th those declines are comparable to what we were seeing in, in 2011. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that that we also have seen, we have seen, you know, less water use. Um, we didn't have to we did in, in 2022, we didn't have to release as much water uh, so far in 2022 compared to, to 2011. Um, so far through the end of, uh, well, through September, the total water use from the BRA's water supply system in 2022 is just under 300,000 acre feet. Uh, for comparison, on average year, we, we use, or the customers use about 250 to 280,000 acre feet. So we've already, you know, got to the point of of what we typically use in it in one year, uh, in the first you know nine months. For comparison, in 2011, at this point, um, we had used about 420,000 acre feet of water. So you know, we've seen around 30 percent less demands, um, you know, on the system than in 2011. And part of that is because of, of downstream water supply releases and availability in 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 the river flows below the reservoirs. One other thing to note on on this. Um, this particular graphic is, as you'll see in 2011, you know, we, we, we had kind of flattened out. Um, as we move further into fall, you know, we have, we have less sunlight that, that acts on evaporation and, you know, typically we'll have cooler months. Um, and so that, that will basically cause the rate of the decline of the reservoirs to slow down and, and flatten out. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the potential for rain um, as we move through fall a little bit later on. Um, you know, so how has this lack of rainfall over the past year impacted the amount of water that's entering the reservoirs? And uh, I mentioned in the last brown bag, you know, we do measure and, and calculate the amount of water that, that enters the reservoirs. And, and that's basically from a water balance perspective. We know the change in, in water stored in the reservoirs from month to month. We know what's released. We know the demands or the diversions from from the lake, and and we estimate and and know, and know the evaporative losses, so we can calculate um, the amount of water that's entering the the system in each of the individual reservoirs. Um, for the first two thirds of of 2022, you know, we, we've obviously been dry, and and that's evident in how little water has made it into the reservoirs since January. So this bar chart it it compares the cumulative monthly inflows of the 11 reservoirs in, in acre feet. So an acre foot is you know, basically a football uh, field um, you know, filled with one depth of water, uh, you know, a foot of water on, on a football field. That's that's an acre foot. Um, you know, it can supply about uh, three households for three to four households for, for a whole year. And so the we, we are looking at now in this bar chart, the average monthly inflows for each month uh, from 90, 1994 to 2021. So that's those are the blue bars. Uh, and then another, um, the green bars is the average in 2011 through 2015. So that's a particularly drier period. And then also the 2011, 2013, and then 2022 inflows. And you can see that in 2022, um, the reservoir system in the months of January through August were, were lower than both of 2011 and, and 2013. And through August 30th of this year, the system has experienced about 420,000 acre feet of inflows. And that's uh, for comparison in 2011, we, we saw about 600,000 acre feet in 20, 
13, 660,000 acre feet of envelope through the end of August. So, you know, we've, as we move into the final months of 2022, it's, it's safe to say that, you know, this has been an extremely dry, um, you know, year. We haven't seen as much rainfall, obviously, uh, particularly above the reservoirs, and that, that equates to, to lack of water that, that flows into the reservoirs. We've overall, we've received about 14% of the inflows in the system that we normally see, um, you know, compared to the 27 year period from 94 through 2021. Here's another graphic that basically encompasses what we just saw in the bar charts, but, but looking at it from a day-to-day a -day basis from January through the end of August for, for those three uh, particular years, 2022, 2013, and 2011, and you'll see that it's interesting in 2011, we did have um, some inflows that occurred in, in late May that, that increased um, you know, reservoir storage to, to some degree. Um, and we didn't obviously didn't see that much rain um, in 2022. And, and, and you can see the, the difference between, um, as I mentioned, between 2011 and 2022. So, so this is another graphic that compares the current drought um, with 2011. Um, you know, what we're seeing, what we're doing here is we're comparing the storage in each individual reservoir, and you'll see that the reservoirs are color coded in the storage difference. So we compared the percent full in each of the reservoirs that occurred in, on October 5th of 2011, 2022 compared to October 5th of 2011. And, uh, you know, overall, really, the, the water supply system is still faring better now than it did at this time in, in 2011. There are some reservoirs that, you know, are slightly a little bit, um, you know, worse than what we saw in 2011, but, but, but not much. The, the, the four reservoirs within the system that are, are slightly worse now is um, the 2011 is Lakes Belton, Granbury, Aquila, and Proctor. And, you know, Belton is storing just over 1% less water um, in tw this time in 2022 compared to 2011. And it's, it's really not much water. Um, it's only 4,000 acre feet less. Uh, and, you know, just for comparison, the amount of water stored in Belton is, is about 310,000 acre feet. And, and we're around 70% full at Lake Belton. Lake Granbury is storing, uh, again, just a little over 1% less than what it was in, at this same time in 2011. Um, but overall, you know, Lake Granbury is, is storing 115,000 acre feet and 85% full. Um, Aquila is about 3% less uh, than in 2011. And, uh, but overall it's storing about 28,000 acre feet of water and, and it's 65% full. And then finally, you know, Lake Proctor is, it's one of the reservoirs that is in, I guess, um, has the lower storages in the system and, and it's about four and a half percent less than what it was at this time in, in 2011. But, you know, we still have 25,000 acre feet of water stored in that reservoir in the upper Leon watershed. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been comparing is, is the drought monitor, um, you know, over time. And, and this is, this is updated weekly and posted on our website at uh, brazos.org under about us and water supply and drought. If you uh, migrate to that, to our brazos.org website, you can find the drought information. So as, as of August 4th, uh, the total, total system storage was around 80% full and we were storing uh, at August 4th of, of 2022, we were storing about 1.55 million acre feet in, in all 11, uh, com combined in all 11 reservoirs. Uh, as of Thursday, October 13th, the total system storage was around 73% full and we were storing about 1.41 million acre feet. So and we still have a lot of water that's stored in these in these reservoirs. Uh, we did we did see a decline of about seven percent, um, you know, over over roughly these these two months, uh, equated to about 140,000 acre feet. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is uh, these drought monitor maps. They're, they're produced by the U.S. Drought Monitor and um, you know collecting information you know, from USDA and the local ag extension agencies throughout the counties, uh, throughout really the whole nation and, and Texas. These really reflect um, from, a, from a larger standpoint, the agricultural impacts of drought, but it's important that we can kind of look and see where drought is expanding and where it's intensifying from, from the drought monitor. Um, you know, soil moisture has to recover, um, 
you know, which typically improves agricultural impacts. And then, um, you know, so you'll see, you know, an improvement in drought monitoring. That's typically, you know, soil moisture being increased and, and agricultural Im improvements. And, and we saw a little bit of that, um, you know, over uh, with the with the rain in, in late uh, August. But you really have to generate significant rainfall to to generate runoff that will increase water uh, that that flows in the creeks and, and rivers, which will finally flow in the reservoir. So you'll see that agricultural impacts um, are are lessened first. You know, uh, ag impacts are are come out of droughts first, and and water supply impacts are really the last to come out of droughts. So you know, as as we've mentioned before, you know, droughts are broken. Um, typically, and and that uh, with, with with large flood events, and um, you know that that's that's something that that we've seen in the past. Um, you know, in the 2011 through 2015 drought, and, and the drought of the 50s as well, is is we see larger um, flood events that that break these droughts. So, as I mentioned, you know, this is the um, graphic that we update uh, weekly on our website, and it's it's the water supply, our reservoir status, and you know, this is kind of looking across the basin, you know, as if you were in San Angelo looking towards Texarkana. The the left uh, part of the graphic is um, the upper, upper part of the basin with, with, with PK. Uh, the right part of the basin is, is um, you know, the lower basin and you see the Gulf of Mexico to the far right. So um, all these colors on, on this graphic, uh, you know, indicates where we are with our drought contingency plan. That is a plan that is required by the state of Texas for uh, a number of different entities um, that that hold water rights. Um, overall, the the total system is in stage one drought, but we're we're still um, you know 73 percent full. I mentioned Lake Proctor. We're currently in stage two uh, drought warning at that reservoir. That's a a 10 percent reduction in in water use overall for a stage one. We're um, we're, we're needing a 5% reduction in water use. Um, I did mention the downstream water supply releases. You know, those be began in, in June, early June of this year. And, you know, so far through the end of September, we've released approximately 75,000 acre feet. And that, that came out of multiple different reservoirs, but, you know, Lakes Whitney, Somerville, Limestone, and Belton. Um, you know, comparing that to 2011, uh, at, in 2011, at this time, we had already released, you know, almost 210,000 acre feet of water. So, you know, the rain downstream of the reservoir has really benefited in delaying and not not needing those stored water releases later in the year. And that's what, um, you know, really caused the difference uh, between 2011 and 2012. Um, I guess uh, the other thing to to look at is, um, you know, reservoirs, what are the decisions in, in, in how we make um, decisions on when and, and, and where to release water for our lower basin customers? Um, typically, the reservoirs located in the, in the upper part of the basin are, are used later in droughts. Um, you know, it takes a long time for water to be, be released from Possum Kingdom and flow downstream to the um, lower portions of the basin. It can, can take three weeks essentially to, to move that water from Possum Kingdom and convey it downstream. Um, and th those reservoirs in the upper part of the basin are, are typically less likely to fill. They're in a drier portion of, of the basin. The central and, and lower portions of the basin typically receive more, more rainfall. So um, we, also, we also take into consideration the lakeside demands of, of the reservoirs in determining when and, and where we can make um, downstream water supply releases. Uh, there has been um, plans that, you know, we are planning to move uh, some of the larger downstream water supply releases from, from Lake Belton uh, that's ongoing. We're releasing now about 400 cubic feet per second from Lake Belton to supply um, customers uh, downstream along the Little River and um, the Lower Brazos in, in, in Fort Bend and Brazoria County. So we plan to discontinue those releases from Lake Belton um, next week um, and we'll, we're anticipated to begin a releases from Possum Kingdom on Monday with a, a release of around 600 to uh, 630 cubic feet per second. Uh, the, 
later next week we'll we'll release from from Lake Granberry um, and that and that'll happen later next week and and those releases from the Possum Kingdom and Granberry system will move through Lake Whitney and so releases we coordinate with the core um, on a daily basis on on releases and we will request water being released through Lake Whitney uh, for the lower part portions of um, the basin for for demand so you know that that is something that um, you know decisions to to make downstream water supply releases are are not made lightly either it goes with a lot of thought and evaluation and 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 process that goes into determining the timing and and need and and when we can move those releases around <clears throat> looking ahead uh, th this is these are the reservoir projections uh, for the end of november um, as you can see yeah we we do we do we are projecting to decline down to 66 percent by the end of um, november and, and that assumes uh, driest conditions and, and high evaporation um, I, I, don't, I don't think that that is going to happen but this is the worst case scenario uh, assuming releases um, you know from all the reservoirs and, and transferring those releases to the upper basin that this is what you know could be the worst case scenario at the end of um, November. We are anticipating um, Lake Proctor to move into stage three drought emergency. That's uh, when the reservoir elevation at Lake Proctor reaches 1153.3. It's another about a 0.1 feet decline in lake level. We, we anticipate that, that will happen um, probably in the next uh, three to five days. And so that's a, a recommendation and, and requirement uh, to reduce water use um, for customers that are using that reservoir uh, for 20%, so a 20% reduction uh, in water use. Let's see. As we've mentioned in the past, um, you know, El Nino and the La Nina events really um, play into the, our weather patterns and can influence uh, the atmosphere around the world. Obviously, um, when we're in El Nino, that, that, that is typically warmer conditions in the equatorial sea surface temperatures off the coast of South America. And that really uh, causes the jet stream to, to bring um, storm systems along the southern tier of the U.S. and, and causes really increased rainfall um, you know, along the southern U.S., including Texas. Now, when that transitions to La Nina, which we've been um, you know, really over the last two or more years, those sea surface temperatures are, are colder than normal, and that causes the storm track to move uh, further up in the latitudes, and you'll see the northern tier of the U.S. Uh, receiving rainfall and ben beneficial rainfall and, and storm systems. Um, you know, we are in La Nina. Uh, we, it doesn't mean we're not gonna get rain. We obviously got rain in August, and there is some rainfall in the forecast for next week. That I'll talk about here in a minute. It just lowers the probability from a long-term perspective uh, that that we will experience uh, normal or wetter conditions um, than normal. That's that's what La Nina does. So you know, this is a bar chart that shows the probability of um, a La Nina condition versus neutral. Neutral just means you know average sea surface conditions. There's really no um, signal in, in how it affects uh, our our weather in Texas, and then El Nino. Um, so what you'll see here is, you know, the, these these larger blue bars indicate a La Nina forecast to be um, higher probability, and and uh, these are the the, the three months um, that, that La Nina National Weather Service and, and NOAA they they look at La Nina on a, on a three month three month average. So you'll see one of the things in, in, you'll see is in February, March, April, and then March, April, May, you'll see these more neutral probabilities of of La Nina transitioning from where it is now in La Nina to neutral conditions and you know that's good news and hopefully that that happens those are longer term uh, projections and that's something to watch if we continue to see this more neutral condition or trans transition to neutral conditions that that'll be good news and may mean you know either normal or above normal rainfall as we enter the next spring um, you know, if we do experience La Nina conditions next year, it would be a, 
a third consecutive winter to, to feature La Nina conditions, and that's, you know, some people call that a triple dip La Nina, and it's only happened twice since 1950, so it, it's a rare occasion. Uh, the seasonal outlooks uh, from NOAA combined effects from the long-term trend, soil moisture, and then also when appropriate El Nino. So the um, upper left graphic shows the seasonal precipitation outlook and um, you know, the below normal, uh, we're, we're right now the National Weather Service is, is basically uh, predicting below normal probabilities in, in our part of the the world and also above normal temperature. And you can see the, the seasonal drought look um, out drought outlook tendency, uh, drought development is is continued to to persist over mo most of the U.S. And then finally, I do want to mention that um, you know there is a stronger cold front that is supposed to make its way um, into the into the basin in Texas uh, Saturday into Sunday and, and into Monday, and that's going to generate some some rainfall. This is the one week precipitation forecast uh, for the U.S. and you'll see these bright colors in, in purple, um, you know, in the in the southern part of the Texas and, and into the lower portions of the, of the basin. So, you know, anywhere from two to two and a half inches is, is forecasted right now. And this is the one week precipitation, but most of this rain is going to fall up most likely from Sunday into Tuesday. So, you know, we'll we'll watch that and, and see if we get enough rainfall, you know, we may be able to discontinue the downstream water supply releases. Thank you, Aaron. A, a few points I'd like to drive home very briefly. One is that our reservoirs are doing what reservoirs were designed to do, and that is store water uh, for dry times. So they're performing like they're supposed to perform, and we have a lot of uh, water available to help get us through a prolonged drought. The other thing that I would what I would mention real quick before I turn it over to Blake is when you looked at that three-month forecast for uh, less than uh, normal rainfall, one thing to take home from that is that uh, typically, November and December are pretty dry months anyway, so uh, don't let that alarm you. Uh, but also just wanted to remind folks that that Aaron and his team of experts are, are monitoring uh, this every day and, and a lot of thought and science and technology goes into understanding how much water to release and when uh, and a tremendous amount of communication with our uh, with our customers on how they're going to take it and how much they need uh, happens on a, a weekly basis. So. Uh, they're 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 monitoring it closely, and you can stay in, in engaged on our webpage or are asking us questions, and we'll be back. Uh, you'll see more of Aaron again in November when we talk about uh, when we have our brown bag after our next board meeting, or maybe in December. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Blake real quick, our technical services manager, uh, and he's in charge of uh, project delivery and, and our projects that help us uh, manage and release our water so that uh, we have a reliable water supply. Blake. Thank you, David. Um, so hopefully everybody can see the slides. Um, just wanted to provide a quick update on some uh, uh, some items pertaining to project delivery as well as maybe a, a few project updates. So as David said, Blake Kettler, I'm technical services manager. Um, understanding where, where this update's coming from, technical services kind of leads up uh, all the stuff on uh, uh, the uh, uh, the capital improvement or capital uh, project side of things. So we provide support to the basin through uh, project management, um, engineering, uh, construction services, capital planning, that type of stuff. So uh, with that, we'll jump into it. Um, those of you who, uh, OK, there we go. Uh, those of you that tuned into the board meeting um, probably saw this same information. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, this is kind of the same format we use to provide uh, project updates to uh, our board members, as well as what we put out on our website uh, there for, for project updates. So trying to keep the same format there. Um, there's a lot of information here. I don't don't expect you to digest it all, but just wanted to provide a quick update on what we're doing with our project management office. So uh, back in 2020, we implemented our, our project management office or stood it up. Um, so basically, it's a support function for project management uh, throughout the organization. So we provide support uh, or we support the BRA mission by developing, implementing best practice methodologies to train, equip and enable project managers to deliver projects that exceed stakeholder expectations. So basically what the project management office does, we're not a directed function to project management. Uh, those project managers 
report to uh, their corresponding departments, but we act as a support network to make sure we're doing business uniformly when it comes to uh, to project management. So all of our, our education, our standardization through templates, processes, uh, all that type of stuff, and, and just any support that they may need, whether it's, you know, helping with uh, develop things for, for upcoming board meetings or helping uh, uh, navigate through the, the risk management committee process, things like that. So we're well underway with that. Um, we've seen the benefits already in the organization uh, through, through, through the progression of projects. Um, and I think that's kind of the message you'll see here is uh, we've got a lot of projects coming to uh, construction or fruition to construction. So. Um, some of you may have seen this and some may have not. Uh, this is a typical uh, life cycle for a, a BRA project. Um, not all projects, of course, uh, you know, fall within this flow chart, but this is just to give you a general idea of some of the work uh, at a very high level that that's needed to uh, to complete a given project in the organization. So the main takeaway here is a color coding. So you can see the green, yellow, orange and blue. Um, we've uh, we've started to kind of align some of our processes and in, in the way we do business with uh, the, the project management institute and I believe we have uh, uh, somebody uh, one of our project managers that just recently uh, completed their project management professional certification uh, uh, through this uh, uh, through the project management institute but trying to align uh, the way we do business and projects with industry standards so that way when it comes to reporting functions or anything else um, th there's some uniformity there. So the, the reason for me showing you this today is just so uh, if you see future brown bags or, or future board meetings, um, you know, a lot of our reporting functions will be in line with the phasing of projects here. So in green, the initiating phase, that, a lot of that's happening before a project comes to fruition in our annual operating plan. Um, that's the brainstorming and, and understanding and developing the project concept and objectives that, that we're looking to complete there. Once it comes to fruition, it's included in the annual operating plan. And then we once we activate the project or start working on it, we, we move into that planning phase. There's not a whole lot of money spent um, uh, uh, on in, in this phase here. It's it's more captured in department overhead because we're still developing your request for proposals, stuff like that, going out with the solicitation, negotiating contracts, stuff like that. Once we get into the executing phase here, that's when uh, we're, uh, um, you know, we, we start um, actually doing the work, doing those assessment and designs and, and putting together the bid package and moving through with construction. Uh, and then, of course, blue is the uh, the closeout. So just wanted to provide, uh, you know, some of those changes that that um, you may see at, at upcoming board meetings, brown bags, stuff like that. Those are some some recent uh, shifts on the uh, project management side of things. So with that, we'll roll into a few project updates. Uh, the first one is the Lake Limestone Tanner Gate replacement project. So what we're planning to accomplish out there is trying to, uh, or, or we're going to replace all the uh, the tanner gates out there, um, all the hoist systems, everything associated with with the uh, uh, the release of, uh, of floodwaters there. So basically, that's the purpose of these tanner gates is to provide a mechanism to to pass those those uh, volumes of water. At, as you're well aware, we don't have flood storage capacity in our reservoir, so what's coming in must go out. Um, uh, one thing to I think that's important to note here is that we will not be lowering the lake level uh, to to change these tanner gates. We actually have a stop log system that uh, will put stop logs in place, which will cut the flow off to that tanner gate, um, and then we can we can go in, remove the tanner gate, and replace it. So we've been going through design uh, with uh, Stantec uh, for a few years now uh, to uh, to get this project to fruition. And this past year, uh, we've. Uh, uh, put out a request for bids and selected McMillan Jacobs uh, as our contractor to, to make that make that all happen. So currently where we're at, um, the, the gates themselves are, are being produced. We've acquired all the uh, uh, the, the different materials and they're, they're being manufactured off site um, down towards Houston. And once those uh, gates are built, they'll be uh, they'll be brought on site. Um, and then they'll be moved with a barge out to the dam and uh, a crane will will facilitate removing the existing tanner gate and installing the new tanner gates. So where we're at, um, we'll start uh, doing some some mobilization here in the first quarter of 23. Mobilization will include uh, prepping kind of the the lay down area um, wh where we're going to uh, have the barge on the water, uh, you know, all, all that good stuff. Um, and then hopefully uh, we'll uh, see um, our gates show up here uh, later in FY23. Um, with with beginning installation in in the third quarter. 
The next uh, project, and, and David kind of touched on this one briefly, so I won't spend a whole lot of time here. Um, out of our out at our intake uh, uh, there on Lake Granger, and this this provides water to our East Williamson County plant. Um, we've noticed some uh, um, some erosion along this shoreline. It's it's a south line shore, so we get a lot of those north winds uh, during the winter months. And in the material out there has you know it, it's 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 like a marl kind of uh, material. So it you know wave action stuff like that breaks it down really easy. Um, so what we're going in and doing is uh, beefing up the shoreline with with kind of a, a protective layer. Where we're at with that, we've completed the design. We've gone through the bid process. Uh, and we've selected GSI or Geostabilization International as our as our bidder there. Um, so we we're working on getting a, a contract currently executed with them. We're also working for approval from the Corps of Engineers because this is a core reservoir um, uh, to make sure that they give up and give us the thumbs up to uh, to start the work. So we're looking at having all those um, all those checkpoints and in, in the uh, uh, signing of the contract here pretty soon and, and beginning uh, construction shortly after. We're going to go to uh, Lake Granberry now. Um, this is um, this is Day Cordova Bend Dam. You can see the big Tainer gates here. Um, that's the uh, same as uh, similar to Sterling C. Robertson or Lake Limestone. That's how we pass or pass floodwaters. Um, over here, as highlighted, is the low flow facility. So that's kind of the intermittent release source. So when we don't want to use the Tainer gates, because most of the time when you open Tainer gates, it's a significant amount of water that you'll release. Uh, we can use the, the low flow gates to release those smaller smaller amounts if we need to pass uh, floodwaters or whatever it may be downstream. Um, what we're doing here is we're going to go in and replace those gates and, and, and some other different components uh, there at the low flow facilities. Uh, we selected Gannett Fleming a few years back uh, to help us uh, uh, put together des the design. We've completed that. We've gone out for bids and uh, uh, have uh, selected marine diving uh, to, to help us install those. Uh, they're actually out on site right now, um, so uh, I believe our our new low flow gates will be showing up uh, probably next week sometime. So if you see uh, folks out there working, um, that that's what's going on there. Uh, they're going to go in and replace those gates. Um, and and with that said, again here we're we're not lowering any lake levels. Um, all this is being done with uh, with different you know mechanisms to stop water flow. Um, so you know we'll keep the lake uh, where it's at and and able to uh, service and and replace some of these. These different facilities on the dam. And last but not least, uh, the Environmental Services Building. So this is a, a project that will be built here at our central office facilities here in Waco. Wanted to provide a quick update on this. So if you're driving by or in the area and you see uh, uh, drill rigs or or folks out there pot ho pot pot holding for uh, utilities, uh, you kind of know what's going on. We're still in the design phase there. We we've completed uh, or, or working on the 60% design, and we we should expect the 90% design here pretty soon. Uh, but yes, uh, transitioning the environmental service or the the lab portion of environmental services out from the central office and building a, a separate facility there. Uh, so that's something else that that we're working on. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so that's that's a you know just kind of hitting some of the highlights on projects. Um, David, unless you have anything else for me, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, Blake, I actually do. Talk just briefly about where folks can go follow along uh, for updates on our projects. Okay, so uh, we have out on our website we have our our project update uh, website. How how we get those out there is. Uh, it it kind of serves two purposes. We create similar to those bumper stickers. I'm going to go back one slide. Uh, similar to what you're seeing here, we provide those um, uh, to our board of directors so they can see kind of where what the status of the projects are. What you can see here is uh, uh, the information on the assets some high level schedule and some budget information. What we're actually planning to accomplish with the project and then the status of that project. So we provide those to our board of directors. Also, when we're updating those, we update them on the website. So what you'll see is the uh, the projects that are located out there on the website. Those are the active projects we're working right now. Um, they are uh, updated basically in between each board meeting. So every other month um, we provide an update on where we are with uh, any scheduling changes, budget summaries, um, uh, project status, stuff like that. Of course, uh, you know, if, if if we have major changes there, we will will highlight it if anything changes schedule wise or anything else. So so that way folks can 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 stay aware of where projects are. So yeah, whenever you have an opportunity, uh, please go out there, braz.org and, and look at our, our project update site. Thank you, Blake. Well done. 
Uh, Aaron, talk just briefly uh, in uh, the few minutes that we have remaining. Talk briefly about your uh, the videos that we're doing every other week on drought. Yeah, um, we I, I probably it was late June. We started um, a new process uh, in in conjunction with the Public Information Office um, here at BRA in developing bi-monthly video. So every other week we film um, typically it's a three to five minute segment updating folks um, of what's going on uh, with the drought what we're seeing what to what to expect um, as we move forward so that's a it's a good source of um, of information I think those are um, uploaded to our YouTube subscription if you if you subscribe to us on YouTube you should be getting those um, and so it's a it's a good another good source of information that that we provide um, you know every other week um, on the drought. Okay, thank you, Aaron. And again, I would uh, uh, remind everyone if you have questions about uh, your water supplier or the lake that you live near or anything that the Brazos River Authority is involved in. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, call us or send us questions at information at brazos.org and we'll get you answers as soon as possible. Again, thank you. Uh, thank you to Aaron and uh, Blake for presenting today and, and uh, everybody for tuning in and we'll uh, see you at the next board meeting or see you on the next brown bag. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you for your time.